Good afternoon, I'm Malki Spodek, uh, entomologist in Covey. Welcome to today's seminar as part of the 2024 Covey Lecture Series. Today we are joined by one of our professional affiliates, fungal pathologist, Dr. Wendy McFadden-Smith, who has been working with integrated pest management since 1991. Wendy is a tender fruit and grape IPM specialist with OMAPRA in Vineland. She is responsible for providing technology transfer to the fruit industry in Ontario and has been involved in applied research and extension in, fruit, in tree fruit and viticulture in Ontario for 30 years. Wendy is also an adjunct professor in the Department of Biological Sciences and a professional, professional affiliate of the Cool Climate Oniology and Viticultural Institute here at Brock University, St. Catharines, Ontario. Beyond the technology transfer to the fruit industry, Wendy has also invested her time researching the etiology of sour rot, grape fungal pathogens, grapevine viruses, and emerging insect pests. With an ever-changing landscape in terms of climate, the introduction of foreign pests can be devastating. Please join me in welcoming Wendy and her presentation on the spotter lantern fly. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to jump right into it. Thank you for the introduction. Spotted lanternfly has been in the news. CBC, CTV, um, Globe and Mail, Toronto Star, City News, and this is my favorite one. Um, <laughs> sex trade lanternfly being ramped up in New York City as insects look for mates. So this is how we look at spotted lanternfly versus other invasive species. It's a flashy, big insect getting lots of press. So what is it? Uh, the scientific name, Lycoderma lycorma delicolata. It's a plant hopper native to parts of China. It's invasive in South Korea, Japan, and the northeastern United States, where it was first detected in 2014 in Pennsylvania. They think that it came in on a load of stone imported from China. It weakens and kills the plant through feeding behavior and excretion of honeydew. So you can see here, this is, this is the adult with its wings down. This is the picture that you see most often with the wings out because it's so beautiful. And here's an adult and some fourth and star nymphs. You'll also notice that anything that isn't an adult probably has a credit because we haven't found it here. So I'm blowing my whole story. <laughs> okay, there are a lot of spotted, fly spotted lanternfly imposters. For example, this is an egg mass of spotted lanternfly on a tree, and this is an egg mass of spongy moth. We also had reports in Facebook pages and iNaturalist where people will see lichens on the surface of trees and think that it's spotted lanternfly. So these are the different growth stages, first, second, third, fourth, instar, box elder bugs. Everybody gets box elder bugs getting into the summer. And the bright red color made people think of this fourth instar. Milkweed bug, fire bug, not spotted lantern bug. I had somebody from across the street in the subdivision bring in a tiger moth last, last summer. Um, kind of, sort of matches, but not quite. Uh, leopard moth, uh, ilium moth, underwing moth, all possible lookalikes. And then we have the non-traditional lookalikes. Uh, and this one I am critiquing because the lanternfly actually has yellow stripes on its abdomen and they kind of miss that in their, their uh, costume. So looking at the life cycle, because that's what pathologists and entomologists do, we'll start out with the overwintering stage, the eggs. So they're very difficult to spot. They kind of look like mud splatter. They're laid on anything, any flat surface. Christmas trees, rocks, barbecues, tree trunks, tractor trailers, train cars, the three-point hitch on a tractor, anything. In uh, May and early June, they will start to hatch and produce the first instar. The first through third instars are progressively larger, going from 0.3 to 0.7 centimeters in size. They're very difficult to spot. They tend to go on the under surface of, the, of, of objects, plants, 
They have a very broad host range and they will feed primarily on herbaceous plants. They can kill seedlings and limbs and full-size trees by their feeding. They are incapable of flight. This goes for the fourth and star as well, but they have very sticky feet. The fourth and star shows up in July to September, so you can see it here. It's quite a bit larger, a lot easier to see. And in this case, it starts to move from herbaceous hosts into woody hosts. The adults start to show up in July through November. And remember, this is all taken from information from the states. So there could be a bit of a shift depending on how they respond to our temperature conditions. Uh, fairly easy to spot, it's a flashy insect. Uh, easy uh, climbers and strong hoppers, and these ones are able to fly with their biggest dispersal flights beginning in August through September. Whoops. I guess. Oh, and then egg laying starts in September through November. So looking at the eggs, they lay, a female will lay 30 to 50 egg, eggs in, uh, in rows up to four centimeters long. So each one of these was laid by a single lanternfly adult. So this would be recently laid and this is laid, this is some time past. They're initially white and then they turn gray and they crack. So they're covered in a waxy coating, which makes it almost impossible for any kind of pesticide or control measure to penetrate in. As I said, they're deposited on any flat, rough surface, bark, rusty metal, wheel wells, very tricky to find in wheel wells. The undersides of vehicles, even harder when you can't fit underneath them. Uh, pots, landscaping, stone, decks, you name it. If it's flat, they'll lay on it. Lay on it. I always worry about students if they're too slow to hear. Um, the peak lay egg laying starts, is, occurs around the fall equinox. And this is regardless of where it is in geographical location from Virginia, North Carolina, up to Michigan, egg laying coincides with the fall equinox. And this is the overwintering stage. So another thing that's interesting is on tree hosts, it lays, the prime, uh, majority of its eggs are laid in the top part of trees. So this is, I'm six feet tall, and this is some spotted lanternfly eggs up here. This is a graph taken from some work that a uh, colleague Brian Walsh did in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, the different colored bars are two different locations, and what you can see is about 80% of the eggs are above nine meters height. So when they say squash the egg clusters, it makes you feel good, but it's probably not going to have a major impact on the population. So they are sap feeders and they feed by pushing this very prominent proboscis into woody tissue. All of the stages have a proboscis, so they're all able to penetrate into the phloem and feed on the phloem sugars. So the plant through to the sap, in the phloem of the leaves, the stems, the branches, and the trunks. So the adults and the fourth instars can actually penetrate woody tissue. This can result in yield loss or quality reduction in vineyards, reduction of cold hardiness, or even dieback and plant death. And they also produce copious amounts of honeydew. So this is a video, so watch over here. It's coming. Here it goes. See right here? That's the honeydew squirting up. So initially it was thought that the pressure for squirting that honeydew was strictly due to the, the, the pressure in the vascular tissue, but researchers have actually determined in Pennsylvania that they have the mouth parts that will allow them to forcibly eject that, that honeydew. The nymphs, the first, second, third nymphs have the widest toast range, uh, and then they begin to specialize as they become adults. They all share this behavior where they will tend to climb up. Malky, what's the technical word for that inclination of climbing up? There's a science word for it. No, I have it up there. Okay. Anyway, they do that. All of them. And what they'll do is they'll climb up to a high point, and then they'll drop off. And then they'll climb up another one, and then they'll drop off. And they keep doing that over and over and over through their life cycle. The red coloration of the fourth instars could be a warning for predators 
They also tend to feed on Tree of Heaven, which has a very bitter compound in it, kind of like monarch butterflies feed on, on milkweed because it makes them taste yucky. The same with the spotted lanternfly. However, it does not rely on the Tree of Heaven, Alanthus, to complete its life cycle. So here's just a few of the, the hosts, roses, perennials, grape, tree of heaven, black walnut, butternut, river birch, willow, sumac, red maple, and what you'll notice is all of the growth stages can be found on grape and tree of heaven. They tend to move off some of the more herbaceous uh, hosts into the woodier hosts, but the whole growth cycle can be found on grapevine and tree of heaven. And once again, that fall equinox is a signal for uh, egg laying. It has to do with egg laying. It has more than 170 plant hosts, including grape, apple, peach, black walnut, maple, so on, and tree of heaven. The favored ones, grape and tree of heaven. Kind of interesting, in a visit to uh, Pennsylvania in the fall, we were talking with growers of tree fruit. And what they said was that the lantern flies would land, they might feed very temporarily, but then they would move. So they never caused any damage or yield loss or downgrading of fruit due to black mold, sooty mold as a result of the honeydew being present. So it's kind of like COVID that we started out with alarm bells, warning and everything, and then every time we learn something new, the story changes a little bit. So, Tree of Heaven is their preferred but not obligate host. This is an invasive species. Look for these along the, four, along the QEW, along railway tracks. Um, they're very distinctive. Once you've seen them, you will always see them. I was riding a train from middle of Czech Republic into Vienna, and I counted 52 of the window on my way. Um, there is an identification sheet at this link, or you can also use the SEEK app to determine whether what you're seeing is actually a uh, tree of heaven. Just a few distinguishing features. The first thing, the, leaf, the leaves are smooth and they have this little glandular tip right here. And when you rub them, they kind of smell like rancid peanuts. Almost like multicolored Asian meal, or lady beetle. The, the bark on the tree uh, looks like cantaloupe, the surface of a cantaloupe and they have heart-shaped leaf scars. The inflorescences are small and white. Here's a close-up, and this is what the fruit look like, the Samaras. So they may look a little bit like sumac. Sumac and black walnut would probably, and butternut would be the ones that you would most often confuse them with. But if you look for all of these traits, specifically the bark, that makes a big difference. So, back when we were first learning about spotted lanternfly, the rule was it needed to have Tree of Heaven in order to complete its life cycle, but this is not the case. It was done with a very small sample size, we were just learning about it. Tree of Heaven is a preferred food source for spotted lanternfly, however, it doesn't have to be present in order for it to complete its life cycle. So what you'll see here, nymphs can walk up to 65 meters from one location to another, adults can fly up to 50 kilometers in a year in short bouts of flight. I don't know if you can really see it, but all those brown flickery things, those are all spotted lanternfly flying. So when you first started learning about spotted lanternfly, the rule was they can't fly. They will climb up something, launch themselves off, catch air currents, and move, but that's been disproved. This is just an example of some of the, the flights that they've done. So there was a, a tree of heaven over here with lantern fly, initially nothing here, and eventually they found it here. So this is a, about 0.7 of a kilometer across this quarry. And another one from a, a, a hedgerow to another uh, host on this side. So they are capable of flying fairly long distances. Not across the Niagara River, but they can fly. So the nymphs from overwintered eggs can be killed by some of the pesticides that we use for other pests in the vineyard. However, the kill is not always comparable. 
So what you can see in this is that uh, this is separating, the pie graphs are separating where on the vine you would find the spotted lanternfly. So the first in starch you're going to find primarily on the shoots where the tender leaves are. Progressively they move down and eventually the adults and the eggs are on the trunks. <coughs> The adults will move into the vineyards in the late summer to early fall, August, September. Uh, there are border pests, 50 to 80% of the spotted lantern flies in evaluations are found in under 20 meters from the vineyard's edge. For management in the States, they're relying on short pre-harvest interval products for pre-harvest sprays and then looking at the possibility for products that have a longer residual activity after the grapes have been sprayed to try to bring down the populations before they move on to other ripening fruit. The impact in Pennsylvania viticulture, it was found, remember it was found in 2014 in Philadelphia. Uh, by 2017, we went to the vineyard that had this, a 90% crop loss in 40 acres. That, is, that was all pumpkins when we went to see it this fall. Uh, another one in 2018, loss of one Pinot Noir planting. 2018-2019, uh, there's been some increased vineyard detections, but it's a tricky pest because it moves. It, mo it flies, it can move very easily, and so what can be a hot spot one year may not be a hot spot the next year, which makes it really ch challenging to do trials on it. Um, overall, increased pesticide, insecticide use from four, which would be routine, up to 14. So think about the economic impact, the environmental impact of increasing um, almost four times. Increased costs, up 171%, and it's having an effect on the growers as well. They're, they're reconsidering whether they even want to replant or expand, and a lot of stress to the grower. This is some work that Michaela Centenary did uh, and at Penn State where they had caged vines where they looked at the effect of different levels of spotted lanternfly population on vines to see how it affected carbohydrates and nitrogen. And basically what they found was the biggest effect was on the roots. Reduced sugars, reduced soluble sugars, um, reduced nitrogen, so this all feeds into that thought that feeding, excessive feeding by spotted lanternfly can actually reduce the winter hardiness of the vines. Chemical management, this is kind of like my nightmare, <laughs> looking at this. Um, from August through October, the adults will move into the vineyard from border areas. They'll tend to, to focus mostly in wooded areas around the vineyards. Then they are applying frequent insecticide applications because they're looking for a short uh, residual activity. Uh, so they have to keep going in because the lanternflies keep coming in in waves. Uh, we have no thresholds right now, they're working on it. And there has been some work that suggests that border treatment, so this is a, a chima sprayer where all the nozzles have been raised to the top and then they're just spraying the periphery. You could also accomplish this by just running rows and rows with your air blast sprayer to get good coverage. So, what do they have to control these buggers in the states? Whoops. Um, what you'll notice here in the brackets are the insecticide groups. And what you'll notice is that threes, fours, and ones. So the threes are pyrethroids, uh, and they're the preferred ones because they have a longer residual activity. So once they're there, the insects will come in, feed, and they will be killed by the insecticide, and they also have good knockdown. Bifenthrin is the one that they seem to rely on primarily as growers, and that is not in Canada, and it is not coming to Canada. This is a real concern for us. This is, a, I think this one is Cape Spring. Um, so a lot of our vineyards abut right up to the, uh, the escarpment. And this was a survey of host species that are present in the Niagara escarpment, in Niagara, and black walnut is a very favored host, and wild grapevine. 
So the movement, once it gets here, if it establishes in the escarpment, it's going to move into the vineyard. It also has an ecological impact. Um, so what you can see, the shiny stuff, this is all the honeydew that has been exuded from the back end of the, the lanternflies and superficial saprophytic fungi will feed on that, making it turn black. You may also see some whitish mold there. Down below in the understory, uh, this is another site that we visited in PA. Everything was covered in sooty mold. So this is going to affect the photosynthetic activity of the understory. Um, it's also going to affect the photosynthetic capacity of host plants. So a weakened zone makes them more susceptible to other diseases and also to uh, phys phys physical stresses like drought or excessive water. So this is a, a honeydew shower. So all those droplets, that's honeydew coming down from the spotted lanternflies. So you can see how the understory would be coated in this stuff and the black mold would, would just take over. Also has a social impact. Here we've got our little child kitty car right beside a tree covered in spotted lanternfly. They're gonna lay their eggs wherever. These steps are covered in sticky honeydew. This one has been cleaned off. This is what it looked like before. And the other thing is that stinging insects are attracted to the honeydew as well. So risk for uh, insect stings. Some of the long, well they can fly up to 15 kilometers a year. That would be in hops where they would climb up a tree, fly, climb up a tree, fly. Their really true long distance spread is uh, by hitchhiking. So you can see here's a Christmas tree with some spotted lanternfly eggs all over this tire. Uh, this is irrigation tubing on the side of this pot, and here they're in the center of the T bar. So they can be moved by almost anything. They're capable of hanging on to moving vehicles with these sticky pads on the, the, base, the base of their feet. Um, and they, they can hide in nursery stock. This is a poster that was at a, a summit that I went to, um, and they actually had, this is a Ford Escape, the best car, 2010 Ford Escape. Um, not my car, but my car is a 2010, but anyway, they put lantern flies in different locations on this car, and then they ran wind on it and brought it up to 95 kilometers an hour to simulate a vehicle driving down the highway at 95 kilometers an hour. So what they found was that 50% of the insects were in that well where the windshield wipers go. They could stay in there up to 95 kilometers an hour. First in stars and, set and early adults withstood greater wind speeds and spotted lantern fly in the paint withstood less than on rubber, so they could, when they, they could stick better on rubber than they could on these painted surfaces. So this is one of the videos that was embedded in that QR code. So here's our lantern fly on the surface of the car. You can see the wind is starting to ramp up. And by the end, it's up to 95 kilometers an hour. the wings are tough. So when we think of long distance transport, uh, Pennsylvania has been implementing these inspections where they actually look inside underneath tractor tires looking for spotted lanternfly. Railway cars are a great, great way for them to move and snowbirds. When we look at the map of the, the uh, the infestation, I-70 and I-90 go right through the infestation areas. So travelers going through, if they stop overnight in Pennsylvania for the free tax, the tax-free shopping, they might get infested. So here is uh, just the, the uh, eradication efforts. It hasn't been very successful because they're so good at, at dispersing by eggs on all kinds of different things. 
They're also looking at using sniffer dogs, training sniffer dogs to be able to identify uh, a little bit more effective than an inspector with a flashlight. I don't know whether they're being implemented yet, but I thought of that too. My, my dog would probably just eat them. Um, spot of venture fly distribution. So remember it was found in Pennsylvania, or in, in uh, Philadelphia down here. Uh, in, oh, that circle moved. In 2022, it was found in Buffalo. Um, so all of them moved. Buffalo, uh, Cleveland, and Oakland County in Michigan. And interestingly, these ones here, they're along rail lines. So just thinking about that dispersal. This is a location in Buffalo. This is where we were looking over. So there's Tree of Heaven all through here. This is what we found in Buffalo. So adults laying eggs. There's a highway right here. There's a railway right there. So the potential for spread is very high. Is it here yet? First question everybody asked, thought was, well, it's gonna, it's gonna stay in the South. It's gonna be like Pierce's disease and the vector. It's gonna stay in the South. It's not made to be in our winters. But this slide shows uh, an estimation of where lanternfly could survive. Here we are here. And golly, look. Great growing area, great growing area, great growing area, great growing area, and so on. So everywhere that we grow grapes has a high probability that lanternfly will be able to survive if and when it gets here. This is data that's available publicly through CFIA. Uh, there have been some um, announcements in the press about findings. So this actually shows in interceptions and sightings. So a sighting would be one that was in the public, so whether it's on Facebook or iNaturalist or one of those other digital uh, formats with an image that looks like it but hasn't been confirmed. And an interception would be something where CFIA was inspecting and found the insect. So there's Lincoln right here, uh, Pelham, Fort Erie. This one was interesting. It was a woman who actually emailed me she was, she's an entomologist. She was sitting on the bridge going into Fort Erie and one flew in her window. So far there are no established populations. So we've been trying to monitor for this and it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. The criteria for our, mon our monitoring sites, we're kind of trying to base them on places where there would be long distance travel from the U.S where a vehicle or and something is going to sit for an extended period of time to allow them into the adults to move on or to lay eggs. There needs to be a host tree close to the parking and safe access for monitoring because students are too expensive to, to lose. <laughs> There's a future one here, he's looking a little nervous. Uh, we, in 2000, we actually started doing this in 2016 on a very limited amount of colleagues started doing it. Uh, in 2021, we decided it was time, so we had 21 locations across southern Ontario with a focus in Niagara. These were checked by weekly, so what we have here is a tree with some batting, like quilt batting, wrapped around it, and then this is, a, this is sticky on the inside. And on the surface, we put this info tag with the numbers so that if anybody were interested, they could take a look. 2022, we had 41 locations with 110 traps. We changed to a commercial version of the bug barrier. They were checked every two weeks. And we actually had a QR code on here so that people could digitally go to the PM or the CFIA website. 2023, 169 traps and 89, or 160 traps and 989 sites. Uh, so here we have the locations in Essex County, or in, in Niagara, here in Essex County, including Keeley Island, and here in Prince Edward County. We also had some of the wineries in the Ottawa Valley putting these up. And we've had a, a, a new and prettier tag for this year, and it takes you to the Castle Lake that O'Malley has produced. We also found some different sites, uh, High Park, out by the airport in Toronto. Uh, conservation areas. We even had one at the visitor center in Sault Ste. Marie 
If you think about that, that one that's in the middle of the Michigan Minton, transport up, could move it up. So those QR codes, we could actually track when people were clicking on them. So this just monitor, this just shows uh, when people were, were clicking on those. So this is our, our QR code for the, the banding, 94 scans. Doesn't count people that just look at them, but it's something. The other thing we did for public awareness was we put developed these two signs, digital signs that were put up in the rest stations at Tilbury, West Lorne, Dutton, and Malloryville, so that when people were traveling, stopping to eat their Wendy's or A and W or whatever, Tim Hortons, or any other thing that I've forgotten, um, they would see this. Um, they, they flashed a little fast as far as I'm concerned, but the QR code was there, and we did have some hits. So the idea, I wanted to get a billboard, but we can't afford it. So what are our management op options? The first one, as a, as a grower, includes spotted lantern fly in your spotting program, in your scouting pro program. Make sure that you can recognize the eggs, all the different nymphal stages, and the adults. Check posts along the border if you're close to a, a treed area, or even if you're close to a ditch that has a lot of wild grape fruit. Uh, look for eggs in other life stages, sooty mold, weeping on trunk, tree trunks, and that stuff actually has a smell. I tasted spotted lantern fly. Remember that 98% of the egg masses are above two meters, so you're gonna have to look up. Key tools in the US, I already mentioned this, the group three by, by Fentrin and Munix. Um, in Canada, we have uh, proactive pesticide registrations. Kudos to the PMRA for giving us these because it's unusual to get pesticides registered before a pest is present. We have an insecticidal soap that's labeled on grapes, tree fruit, and outdoor ornamentals. Uh, an insecticide Danitol that's labeled on tree fruit. Um, it has a really long PHI, or REI for hand picking, I can't remember which, but what we're looking at this one is possibly getting it as a post-harvest treatment. We have an emergency use for Altus and outdoor and landscape ornamentals. And Bear is also working on getting Savanto Prime registered for a spot of lantern fly and grapevine. And CFIA has uh, approved the use of vegetable oils for homeowners if they happen to find a spot of lantern fly. Uh, researchers have been to the Orient looking from the center of origin for different biological controls. Uh, this is just one of them, there are two of them. Um, so this is the, what the adult looks like, and these are parasitized eggs. This is a, an egg where the, the larva has come out, the nymph has come out, but these are parasitized. Uh, we've also looked at some biopesticides, so some fungal pathogens, Bovaria, Metarhizium, and Ophiocordyceps. Um, the problem with biopesticides is they tend to work fairly slowly, and they're also very prone to rain wash off. So, um, they might be part of an integrated program. They looked at exclusion nettings in, in uh, Pennsylvania in research trials. They're very effective, but not very practical for a grower. We've kind of moved away from that and closed the, whole, and closed the whole vine. So what can you do as normal people? Report Tree of Heaven or possible spotted lantern flies if you find them. Uh, there are a number of different places that you can report to. Um, EDMAPS, CFIA, or the Invasive Species Center. Look for materials that are being brought into your location. Look for the egg masses in different, different stages, on pallets, on posts. Look for signs of mold in the surrounding woodlots, and then look up. So this black is all the sooty mold that's growing on the, the honeydew from the, the trees that have been infested with spotted lantern plants. One of the strategies that was su suggested initially was, let's just remove all of the Tree of Heaven. Um, it is listed under the Ontario Invasive Species Act. It can be useful for biosurveillance and monitoring, so if you know where one is, it's a good place to look for a spotted lanternfly. It has been used as trap trees, so they would identify a tree that spotted lanternfly go to, cut down all the others, and keep that one, and just treat that one tree. The problem is that 
they keep coming and coming and coming. So it's not really practical to remove all of the tree of heaven, but still find it and report it because CFIA is looking for locations to prioritize their survey. The other challenge, wild grapes are good hosts. This is a distribution of wild grapevine vitus riparia primarily in um, iNaturalist. So we know wherever grapes grow, we're going to have wild grapevines. I already talked about this. So a good report. What is a report? So everybody thinks they're a really good photographer. My brother-in-law posts things on Facebook Marketplace, and you have to guess what they are because I think he's moving and he's taking the picture. And these are live insects, so it's even harder to take a good picture. Catch it if you can. If you can, at least take a photograph of it, the egg mask, um, and send it. If you use egg maps, it geolocates. So you have that location right away. Collect a specimen if possible because I love getting bugs. Um, you can put it in the freezer. If it's a nymph or an egg, you can also put it in hand sanitizer or alcohol. This is something that I, they had school kids doing, going out and just scraping the egg masses. But just think about nine meters up in the air. Uh, it feels good, but I don't know how much it's actually going to do for you. If you travel into an infested area, inspect your car, go to a car wash. Go to a car wash twice. I had an idea that we should be installing high-pressure car washes at the border for both trains, tractor trailers, and cars. But Want more information? There's a, le there's a session on spotted lantern fly at the Ontario Fruit and Veg Convention on Wednesday morning. So we'll have the speakers. Also lots of other digital information. Here's the CFIA one. Just some people are trying to find a spot of uh, a, a silver lining on this and they're making honey out of the honeydew from Spotted Lantern Fly. That's it. Thank you. An entomologist, I'm telling you. I'm a wannabe. Nope. Do they have any information regarding the tree uh, species or plant species that the uh, insect doesn't prefer to feed on? Not very many. No. Unfortunately. Yeah. I think you said. Um, it was identified in vineyards a couple years later. See, that's going to be the challenge when it comes here, and that's the whole idea of monitoring, is when it comes, it's not going to be everybody's got spotted lanternfly. It's going to be a focal point from which it's going to radiate. So if we can try to identify any potential focal points, then we can then we can try to keep it. I mean, the states have a lot more money in this than we do, so but knowledge is power, I guess. And maybe we can benefit by being a few years behind them that they've had the money and the research to establish protocols that we'll be able to take advantage of. The other cool thing about spotted lanternfly that I forgot is they are endothermic. Yeah, so they actually produce heat. They're the only, only insect I think that's been identified that is endothermic. But, and then it's not from fluffing their wings. And any studies on like how, like what temperature they could not survive? What temperature they can't survive? Yeah. Yeah, um, there is a, there's work being done in an isolation unit at Sault Ste. Marie, Dr. Amanda Rowe and uh, Julie Urban's group in Pennsylvania have been looking at the temperature thresholds for the different growth stages. One of my challenges to them is it's fine to have a uniform temperature, 
what about when we have our days where it kind of warms up a bit and they activate, then it drops back down again? How, how is that going to affect them? So we're still learning. But I think we're primed for it. I expect to see it this summer, unfortunately, from everything that you've just shown. She just wants it. <laughs> <laughs> I've said it now. <laughs> it's out there. It's recorded. Well, thank you again. This is a token of oh, our appreciation you. for taking your time to thank share you. with us the story. Thanks today. for coming in, everybody. Thank you. So please join us next week, February 14th, as Dr. Kevin Kerr presents um, on the Nova Scotia grape and wine industry after the polar vortex of February 2023. Thank you.